Mark's phone rings. He pulls it out of his pocket. Answers. Todd says, Is this the sloppy cream donut shop? Sorry, wrong number, says Mark, who flips the phone shut and puts it on the table next to him as David predicted. Someone wanted a donut shot. Todd now captures the audio clearly. He even grabs a snapshot from the phone's camera, but it mainly shows the atrium above. David gives the thumbs up signal. From the hotel, they hear Mark say, So, how do we get in there? Holding up one of the blueprints, Pete points to the diagram and says, Through the loading dock door next to the freight elevator. So, here's the deal. We wait until just before. 10 p.m. Once you're sure the door to the elevator room is unlocked, that's when Sid sets off smoke bombs and firecrackers at the northeast corner of the club. That'll cause a whole lot of commotion and distract the security people. While they're dealing with the smoke bombs, Mark, that's your cue to duck into the elevator room. Bolt the door behind you, open the loading dock door, and let the rest of our guys in. What do I do after I like the smoke bombs, asks Sid. Run out through the emergency exit back there. Things inside the club will get unpleasant. No problem, says Sid, relieved. And what should I do, asks Mark. After our guys get in, be sure the door to the elevator room is locked and beat it. Okay. When our guys get to the top floor, they search the apartments for Mike. My guess is the commotion on the floor will probably bring them out in the balcony to see what happened anyway. There's only eight apartments up there. It won't take long. We have the element of surprise. They won't know we're coming, says P. Yeah, it'll take their security a while to regroup, says Joe. What happens when they find Mike, asks Mark. Duh. Kill him. And Shay, too, if he happens to be there. Toss their bodies over the balcony. It'll be a nice touch. Jack will love that. I'm sure he would, says Joe. On their way out, they torch the apartments to make sure there aren't any files there to be discovered. The roof of that place is wood. It'll burn real nice. Then quick back down the spiral stairs, and they're out through the loading dock. Outside, we have a van across the street, and they're off. Won't this attract the police? Sure will. That's why I Outside, we torch a few cars over in that big lot across the street. Maybe one outside the front door. The place will be chaos. The police will have a lot of things on their hands. They won't be able to sort anything out for hours. How many guys go in, asks Joe. I figure four to work the top floor, says Pete. Okay, so when my guys get up top, what if Mike spots them and calls for help, asks Joe. How's he going to get help if the only way up is blocked? Anyway, if there's a problem, they toss a fucking firebomb over the balcony. That'll take their mind off the top floor. That it? Nope. I got a better idea. Jack will love this. He's a sadistic bastard. Well, our guy go up top. I want Tom and Bob to go to the second floor balcony and wait. When our guys are done and on their way down, I want them to firebomb the ground floor. Jeez, that place will be full of people, says Joe. Yeah, I know, but we're burning it to the ground. The fires on the top floor and a few firebombs on the first floor should do the trick. This will send a little message not to fuck with Jack. Jack wants the news organizations to know he doesn't like investigations. You'll love it. You told him yet? No, it's a surprise. Yeah, he'll be surprised, that's for sure, says Sid. Well, guys, that's the plan. Smoke bombs and fireworks for First, then the break-in, then the fire. Any questions, says Pete? Shit. Did you clear this with Jack yet, asks Joe. No, I don't need to. Jack wants me to take care of this business, and I'm going to send a message. This is the message. Anyone got a problem with that? Uh, no, says each. Okay, then, tonight at 10, says Pete. Anyone want seconds? Yeah, I think I'll get some more bacon, says Sid. Me too, says Mark, who gets up and puts his cell phone back in his pants pocket. Time, 9.30 a.m. Todd says, damn, put the phone back in his pocket. So unless he gets another sloppy cream call, I guess that's all we're going to get for now. Well, they're going for the big time. Public massacre. I guess if he really wants to send a message with some serious shock value, that'll do it. Question is, what do we do, says David, looking around the room. Yep, he's sure looking for a lot of dead bodies, says Mike. What kind of maggot is this guy, asks Todd. Dude, you have no idea. These shitheads will do anything. They're complete psychopaths. Any idea what the crap they sell does to people? Jeez, shooting them would be a mercy in most cases, says Jay bitterly. Yeah, that's all true, but the immediate question is, now what do we do, says Mike. I still say we play along and spring a trap. If all we do is thwart them, they'll just try again, says Lance. I say we give them a serious bloody nose. We need to send a message to Jack, too. Yeah, but I don't want anyone getting hurt, says David. Well, we know their plan. We may find out more later. There's still a lot of listening devices out there. I can be ready with trash barrels to smother any smoke bombs and firecrackers, says Lance. And if they bring them in and leave them in their coats like last night, I can fix them so they don't work very well. Why let there be any smoke? Why not confiscate them or turn them into complete duds, says Mike. Well, because Mark won't go for the loading dock door until he sees Sid set off the smoke bombs, and we don't get our shot at Joe's guys unless he does, says Lance. What's in a smoke bomb anyway, asks Mike. Oh, just some potassium nitrate and sugar. Easy enough to buy at any fireworks store. All different colors, too, if you want. No big deal to make your own, says Jay. Hello? When do we start our cooking school for bombs? Asks Mike. Oh, really? I just searched for it. You didn't think I knew, did you? Says Jay. Christ, you worry me sometimes.
says Mike. So, okay, I didn't search for it. I knew it. Right then, we give him the smoke bombs, but defanged. What about the loading dock door, says David. I wouldn't worry about it. I'll have the place nailed down, says Lance with a smirk. You figure you can handle this? Yeah. Most plans kind of fall apart without the element of surprise, says Lance. We know they're coming. I'll be ready. And anyway, we may learn more by tonight. By the way, we need to take out their van and have one of our own ready. I want all of Joe's people out of here as soon as possible. I got a feeling this might attract a lot of attention. Police attention. I don't want any of Joe's people here when the cops arrive. Too many questions we don't want to answer right now, cautions David. Right. I can take them over the garage in 38th Street and hold them there. We decide what to do with them later. I'll block their cell phone calls with a signal jammer while all this is going down so they can't talk to one another, says Todd. Good idea, says David. Time, 9.30 a.m. As Thursday morning breaks, the wind chill is down to minus 30 and the air temperature is minus 15. The stiff northwest winds pour endlessly and unrestricted across the barren prairie. The light, powdery snow continues to drift into intricate new arrangements as snow plows flock daily to reopen closed highways. The wind promptly closes them again in a few hours. Most roads now are just hard-packed, snow-covered surfaces, salt and sand having no effect in sub-zero temperatures like this. But surprisingly, snow isn't very slippery when it's this cold. To this frosty world, Tom and Bob rise about 9.30 a.m. Bob, in his underwear, peers unhappily out the window of their tiny shared motel room at a wasteland of cars covered in white. Sighing, he says, Doesn't look good out there. We should go get something to eat and then buy those new coats. Retreating from the window, he sits at the edge of his bed and drags deeply on the first cigarette of the day. I think I saw a discount mart off the interstate. That sound okay? Answers Tom, who's shaving in the small bathroom. Yeah, that's just about my speed. You get ready while I go start the car and let her warm up. Looks friggin' cold out there, says Tom as he wipes the last of the shaving cream from his face, combs his hair, and pulls on a shirt and pants. Tom wraps himself in his heavy hooded coat, now dry but still dirt-covered from two nights before. He pulls on thick gloves and dashes out the door. Bob shivers in the momentary blast of the open door. Tom, getting into the car, slams the door and twists the ignition key. The frozen starter motor groans and slowly turns. The engine coughs and catches, followed by the usual shrill sound of whirring belts slipping as is common in old cars left out in the cold. Tom guns the motor a few times and flips on the heater fan to high. Putting his gloves back on, he retreats back to the motel. Give me a cigarette. Tomorrow you start the car. Jeez, why aren't we in Florida? You any idea how friggin' cold it is out there? Yeah, minus 15. Wind chill minus 30. Just saw the weather guy on TV. Gonna be this way for another week at least. He said stay inside. You should have listened to him. Where the hell is all this global warming? Hey, get dressed. There isn't much gas in the tank. Don't want to burn it all idling in a parking lot. Bob, combing his hair, decides a shave would deprive him of much needed insulation. He pulls on yesterday's socks, pants, and shirt. Getting his coat and gloves on, he says, Well, or anyone you are. Tom switches off the TV and they both run to the car. Tom shoves the car into gear. He applies gas and it thumps forward to the loud crunch of solid snow beneath and the shriek of the slipping power steering belt. As they leave, a waiting car follows them at a discreet distance. Hey, how about that place? Looks like a very fine coffee and roadkill drive through to me, says Bob, pointing at a fast food place. Okay, but if I'm sick, it's your fault. Tom pulls up to the drive through window and asks Bob, what do you want? Uh, let's see. Make mine a large, lukewarm serving of a brown liquid in a cardboard cup with a grilled, greasy, salty, cheap patty of unknown hog parts mixed with what may once have been an egg in a soggy pouch of starchy biscuit, gift wrapped in wax paper and packed in a decorative grease stained white paper bag, please. You want fries with that? says Tom sarcastically. No, I'll just chew on the paper. More nutrition that way. Okay, says Tom, turning to the microphone. Two large coffees, black sugar, four egg sausage and biscuit sandwiches, one order of hash browns. You want ketchup with that comes from the voice in the box? Yeah, thanks, says Tom. Eight fifty two, please pull up to the window. Here's four bucks, says Bob. Tom takes the order, hands the girl a ten dollar bill, takes his change, rolls up the window and pulls the car over to a parking spot in the otherwise empty lot. Motor running, they feast while the windows steam up and freeze over. I don't see how they can call this coffee. I've smelled better battery acid, gripes Bob. Well, maybe we should have hit some yuppie coffee shop for a $20 latte and a croissant. This'll do. Let me have part of that hash brown thing. Hell, why didn't you get your own? Why should I? I can eat yours for free, laughs Bob as he breaks off half the hash brown patty and stuffs it in his mouth. Bastard, you'll pay. Just wait. And they've loaded up on carbs, salt, and fat. They toss the debris into the back seat with many others and drive out onto the main road. A few blocks later, they pull onto the interstate, heading west. After several exits, Tom says, I think it's the next exit. Yeah, I think so, too. It's like there's a lot of stores over on the south side. Tom flicks on the turn signal and pulls onto the exit ramp, still snow-covered in places. At the end, there's a stoplight and he signals left. The light turns green and they drive under the interstate onto the four-lane sprawl of gas stations, convenience stores, fast food restaurants, motels, and supermarkets. In the distance, he spots a tall sign and says, There it is. Thought I saw one. The sign 
in the distance says, Discount Mart, always open. The car turns right onto the massive but nearly empty parking lot before the sprawling flat-roofed emporium. Great mountains of snow rise in the further ends, the work of many front loaders. Scattered around the lot and poking from the snow mountains are shopping carts blown by the wind and carried by the plows. A great cart corral has collapsed, a gust of wind catching its Put Your Carts Here sign and ripping it from its moorings. Its tubular frame lies flattened and collapsed on the snow-packed pavement. Its once captive carts have fled. It's early and the windswept lot is vacant except for a small number of cars and pickups huddled near the main entrance. Only a few desperate souls find their need for cheap imported plastic crap exceeds the pains of the cutting winds.